Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip Emigwali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine. Thank you. I'm Philip Emagwale. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974 at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Gobalis, Oregon, USA. In December 1965, that supercomputer in Corvallis was rated as the world's fastest computer. I was programming a supercomputer that was faster than the one that helped put a man on the moon back on July 20, 1969. Because I was black and African, I was forced to work full time and alone on my research on how to combine computers into supercomputers and did so for 17 years and without any payment that was in proportion to what American billionaires were paid. After working full time and without pay for those 17 years, I felt like that keeping the entire credit for my invention is the only reward that I can have. It was like Chinua Achebe, who is the father of African literature, forgoing his auto royalties, but insisting that he alone be credited as the author of Things Fall Apart. And it was like Felakuti, forgoing his songwriting royalties, but insisting that he is the father of Afrobeat. I'm the father of the world's fastest computing as it's known today. And I'm the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. A question in school essays is this. What was Philip Emma Aguali's education like? I was born on August 23, 1954, in Akure, in the western region of the British West African colony of Nigeria. In January 1960, and at age five, I enrolled in first grade in St. Patrick's Primary School, Sapele, Nigeria. Several students in my class were twice my age. My seventh grade school photos that I posted on my website revealed that some of my classmates were twice my age. From January 1960 to March 1974, I attended on and off six schools within Nigeria. But I dropped out of school for five of those 14 years. I'm often invited to alumni reunions and remembered as the school's most gifted student. For that reason, my former school classmates were not surprised when I told them that I won a scholarship to the USA. My scholarship took effect on September 10, 1973. After a six month delay, I arrived in 36 Butler Hall, Monmouth, Oregon, and on the evening of Sunday, March 24, 1974. Twelve hours after my arrival, I had a conference with a brilliant American mathematician named Beryl M. Green. My goal was to become a mathematician, and Beryl M. Green was assigned as my mentor. To my surprise, we couldn't understand what each other was saying. At that time, I could only understand the spoken Nigerian and British English, and Beryl M. Green could only understand the spoken American English. In retrospect, I should have anticipated my difficulty, 
but I did not. Looking back to the early 1970s, there were no television in the southeastern region of Nigeria, where I then lived. The first time I listened intently to the spoken American was in about May 1973. And during the listening portion of the American TOEFL, the acronym for Test of English as a Foreign Language, I took TOEFL at the Hope Wardell Training Institution, Calabar, Nigeria. Not surprising, I failed the listening portion of TOEFL. In the early 1970s, Nigerians arriving in the USA for the first time could not understand the spoken American English. It took me several weeks to understand the American English. So on my first day in the USA, I wasn't sure what language the mathematician, Beryl M. Green, was speaking. And he felt the same way about me. For several minutes, we stared, we stared at each other and looked confused. To introduce myself, I grabbed a chalk from his desk, walked to his blackboard, and scribbled a difficult problem, mathematics problem that pertained to number theory. I derived its solution. That impressed him. He said that I should go far in the field of mathematics. The following day, Beryl M. Green secured a second scholarship for me. He advised me to transfer 20 miles away from Monmouth to Cavallis, Oregon. That was how I came to Kida Hall, Cavallis, a building that housed the most brilliant mathematicians in Oregon. Directly opposite from Kida Hall was the building that housed the only supercomputer in Oregon. Three months later, I began supercomputing. Back in 1970, in Christ the King College, Onitsha, I was well known, but only known by my nickname, Calculus, not by my birth name, Philip M. Agwale. Calculus is the powerful technique that must be used to solve the most difficult problems in physics. Such grand challenge problems include the computational fluid dynamics models that are used to determine the best social distancing measures that will reduce the spread of the coronavirus disease. Fast forward 20 years into the USA, I was in the news as the mathematician who contributed to calculus. Outside Nigeria, I attended six universities with each one claiming me as its notable alumnus. The last university that I attended has 610,000 living alumni, whom it sends a quarterly update on the best minds on the university campus. The February 1991 issue of Michigan Today was a tribute issue by the University of Michigan on its most renowned scientist named Philip Emma Aguale and his contributions to the world's fastest computing. So I won early acclaim for my contributions to supercomputing and did so across the length and breadth of the state of Michigan. At that time, it was very offensive to white scientific communities for a white American university to glorify a black sub-Saharan African as smarter than Albert Einstein. For that reason, only the portraits of white male scientists were allowed to be exhibited on their wall of genesis. In 1989, I was the first scientist, black or white, to be described as smarter than Albert Einstein. I became an intellectual threat that must be suppressed at all costs. I was controversial because I did not meet the whiteness criterion that was the requirement to be called a genius. To this day, the university 
upholds its tradition of only naming buildings after obscure white male scientists, as well as only displaying the portraits of, of, of obscure white historical figures and displaying them with the intent to lower the self-esteem of its underrepresented students. What's a day in Biafra like? A question in school essays is this. List three interesting events in the life of Philip Emma Aguale. I dropped out of school for five years between ages 12 to 19. I dropped out to live in refugee camps of Biafra of the Nigerian Civil War. One in 15 Biafrans died during that 30 month long war in the list of the worst genocidal crimes of the 20th century that were committed against humanity. The death of one in 15 Biafrans was ranked fifth when the Nigerian Civil War began. My father's residential address was at 4B Ebunadazia Street, or that Onicha Biafra. In late 1967, the Fege and other quarters of Onicha were deserted except for full time looters and trophy hunters. After the attack of October 12, 1967, and during the five and a half months that preceded March 20, 1968, downtown Onicha became a ghost town. At that time, its downtown wasn't a safe place to visit alone. On March 20, 1968, refugees living in Enua Nature called in Lang Town noticed the sudden influx of thousands of frightened Biafran soldiers. Some of those Biafran soldiers confided to their refugee relatives in Enua Nature that they were fleeing from the nearby Abagana battlefield. Those Biafran soldiers were fleeing beyond our nature and towards Oba and Newi. Unknown to us, namely the Biafran refugees in our nature, was that the Biafran soldiers who should protect us were routed by the Nigerian army and we are disorganized. Biafran soldiers defending Onicha fled hastily and fled without alerting us, the 15,000 refugees in Enu Onicha, to join them in their flight to safety. During that 30 month long war, both the Nigerians and Biafrans killed their civilian captives and their war prisoners. That was one reason. One in 15 Biafrans died in 30 months. In 1968, and at the war front inside Biafra, Colonel Benjamin Adekunle, also known as Black Scorpion, who led the third Marine Commando, told a French radio reporter, and I quote, we shoot at everything that moves. And when our troops march into the center of Igbo territory, we shoot at everything, even at things that do not move. End of quote. Unknown to the 15,000 refugees who sought their safety in Enwanisha, thousands of Nigerian soldiers were rapidly thundering from Abagana to Anicha, the Nigerian army had superior firepower while the Biafran soldiers had run out of bullets and were rapidly retreating from the Abagana war front. One of the dark secrets of the Nigerian Civil War was this. On March 20, 1968, the Biafran army used the 15,000 refugees in Onicha 
as their human shields. The fleeing, the Biafran soldiers fleeing from Onitsha had ample time to evacuate those refugees. The Biafran government used those 15,000 refugees who were Onitsha indigents as its human shield. The Biafran government capitalized on the certain deaths of refugees and tendered them as proof of Nigerian genocide against Igbos. Six months earlier, we were refugees at 6 C. Wilkinson Road on Echa. That address was next to Obiokosi Primary School. That school was closed and converted as, a military barrack, as the military barrack of 1,000 Biafran soldiers. The invading Nigerian army considered that Biafran military barrack and by extension, our homes that we are next to, that we are next to that barrack, to be their legitimate military target number one. And in early, and in the early morning of October 12, 1967, and as a 13 year old, I was fleeing along Wilkinson Road, on Onicha, carrying a heavily loaded tin pan on my head. After fleeing with my mother and six siblings, and fleeing towards Ogidi, that was seven miles away. As I turned right into Wilkinson Road, towards Ogidi, I looked to my left, towards Metropolitan College, and saw what seemed to be a house-to-house -house combat. I saw a Biafran soldier crouching with his Satima gun, firing towards Metropolitan College. Unknown to us, the Nigerian army was attempting to capture the Biafran military barrack that was headquartered at Obiokosi Primary School of Umwa Sele, quarter of Edwanicha. That was a shouting distance from our residence at 6 C Wilkinson Road, Onicha. As we continued our flight, and a few seconds later, a bullet casing fell two feet in front of me and on the then untied Wilkinson Road. Another minute later, I saw two Biafran soldiers, whom 10 minutes earlier I saw hiding in the bush behind our house at 6C Wilkinson Road. I saw those two soldiers remove their Biafran army uniform and change into civilian clothes. Like a thousand Biafran soldiers did that early morning, those, early, those two soldiers fled because the better armed Nigerian army had attacked their military barrack. Looking back retrospectively, the Nigerian army implicitly gave the civilians who were living in Enwanicha eight days for warning to flee from Enwanicha. Those were the eight days of continuous artillery shelling of our nature that originated from the banks of the River Niger at Asaba. The Biafran army had eight days to evacuate refugees from the inland town water of our nature, called Enua Nature, to safer villages such as Ogidi or Newi. Instead of evacuating the refugees from the Onicha war front, the Biafran army used those 15,000 Indian nature refugees as their human shields. Those 15,000 human shields included my 28-year-old mother, myself, and my six siblings of ages 1 to 11. We were among the 15,000 refugees who fled back, who fled back on October 4, 1967 from the Fege and Odabo waters of downtown Onicha to Enu Onicha in land waters. Enu Onicha was beyond the artillery reach of the Nigerian army and was therefore safer. Enu Onicha was farthest from the west bank of the river Niger 
at Asaba. That West Bank at Asaba was where the rockets of the Nigerian army that were under the guidance of Colonel Moitola Mohammed, the future president of Nigeria, were fired with reckless abandon and fired upon the Fege and other quarters of downtown Onicha. During those eight days that followed October 4, 1967, of continuous shelling, the Biafran army didn't evacuate the 15,000 refugees who sought shelter in any Onicha that was the inland town quarter of Onicha. The Biafran army used those 15,000 refugees as their human shields and their protection against the steadily advancing Nigerian army that outmanned and outgunned them by four to one. Throughout that 30 month long war, in which one in 50 Biafrans died, the Nigerian army controlled the Biafran airspace and enforced a complete sea blockade of Biafra. After the war was over, I started nursing the ambition to come to the USA. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974 in Cobalis, Oregon. How are supercomputers used in Venezuela? In an email, a 15-year-old writing the biography of a famous computer scientist and his contributions to the development of the computer asked me, how are supercomputers used in Venezuela? The supercomputer market is valued at $45 billion a year. The energy and geoscience industries buy one in 10 supercomputers and use them to pinpoint oil deposits. The Bolivar coastal oil field of Venezuela contains 32 billion barrels of recoverable oil reserves. The Bolivar coastal oil field stretches across 35 miles along the coast of, coast of Lake Maracaibo of Venezuela. Fastest computing that's executed across millions of processors is the key technology that must be used to pinpoint deposits of crude oil in the Bolivar coastal oil field. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering how the slowest processors in the world could be harnessed as the world's fastest computer and used to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas. On June 20, 1974, in Covalis, Oregon, I began programming one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. That was when I began my quest for the fastest computation ever that could be harnessed and used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. As I grew in my knowledge, I wanted to invent my fastest supercomputing as a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 processors, which collectively is 64 binary thousand times faster than the fastest computer that's sequentially processing with one processor. I discovered the fastest supercomputer not as a computer in and of itself, but as a virtual supercomputer that's defined across a globe which hosts a new global network of processors that shared nothing, but we are in dialogue with each other. I recorded the fastest speeds in computing without the supercomputer as it was then known. I visualized my new internet in the 16th dimensional hyperspace. And I visualized that globe to be encircled by two raised to power 16 
or 65,536 processors with each processor akin to a tiny computer. I visualize those tiny computers to be uniformly distributed across that globe or separated equal distances apart. I could discover but not create the fastest computation across my new internet. I can only discover a faster computation if and only if that computation pre-exists across my new internet. And I can only invent techniques and technologies that can be invented or that the laws of physics allow me to invent. The fastest computer that yielded a quantum increase in speed led to the creation of the field of computational physics. The fastest computing across the slowest processors that I discovered on the 4th of July 1989 gave birth to extreme scaled high resolution computational physics. That discovery of the world's fastest computing is my contribution to physics. I'm well known, but I'm not known well. A teacher asked her students, why is Philip Emma Aguale famous? I'm well known because I knew a new arithmetic that no teacher knew. Before my discovery of that new arithmetic, which occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, teachers could only teach how to perform the fastest multiplications and divisions, and how to execute them on a computer that was powered by one processor. After my discovery of parallel processing, teachers could now teach how to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and solve them at the world's fastest speeds and across the Philip Emma Aguale computer. That's not a computer in and of itself, but that's a new internet in reality. Each discovery or invention we make contributes to human civilization. Our technological quest for the fastest computations across a new internet is our search for human progress. To invent a new computer is to turn science fiction to reality. A science fiction writer can be a storyteller who solved the most difficult problem in mathematics and solved it by merely waving his pen and declaring the impossible to solve. It's now possible to solve. In contrast, a computational mathematician can solve the toughest initial boundary value problems at the frontiers of calculus, compute intensive algebra or extreme scale computational fluid dynamics, and solve such physics problems by merely waving his or her hand. As a high-performance computational mathematician, I can only discover the discrete solution to the toughest problem beyond the frontier of calculus and only discover that solution if and only if such a solution exists but was not understood. I can only invent things which are possible to invent. A science fiction writer can write about cars that run only on water, but, not, but which are not possible to invent. In contrast, a scientist must develop a prototype of at least one car that he claims only runs on water. It's possible for a science fiction writer to write 100 science fiction books. In contrast, it's impossible for a supercomputer scientist to make two groundbreaking discoveries in his lifetime. It's impossible for one inventor to invent the world's fastest computer 
that computes in parallel and then later invent the hoped for quantum supercomputer, which wrangles subatomic particles to encode information as quantum bits or qubits that exist in superposition. The inventions of parallel and quantum supercomputers demands radical ideas, billions of dollars, and decades of hard work. The parallel and quantum supercomputers are each paradigm shifting, and each technology change the way we look at the computer of tomorrow. Nature does not give up its secrets without a fight. What are my contributions to the invention of the fastest computers? What did Philip Emma Aguale contribute to the development of the computer? To parallel process, the most difficult problem in mathematics is to solve many less challenging problems at once. The technique of computing many things at once was done to the census board that used thousands of human computers to execute billions of arithmetic computations. My contribution to computer science was my discovery that the world's fastest computer could be powered by 64 binary thousand processors. Each processor was akin to a tiny computer that can be used to solve many compute intensive problems and solve them at once. In 1989, my discovery of fastest computing made the news headlines and did so because it opened the door to the use of up to 1 billion processors to power the world's fastest computer. I visualized my new internet as my new spherical island of 64 binary thousand processors, or as a new global network of as many tiny computers. I visualized that new internet as tightly encircling my room-sized globe. Not only that, I visualized my new internet as two raised to power 16 or 65,536 processors that we are identical and that we are uniformly distributed around the surface of a globe. Likewise, I visualize that hypersurface in a 16-dimensional hyperspace. My visualization of my new internet was new. Therefore, the word internet wasn't in my vocabulary in the, the mid-1970s, I coined the term hyperbolic computer to describe my new global network of computers and processors, which I theorized. That hyperbolic computer was renamed as Philip Emma Aguale computer. My theory, which I physicalized as the fastest computer, was my mental recreation of a new internet as a new supercomputer that was powered by a new global network of 65,536 processors that shared nothing. How did I win the Nobel Prize of supercomputing back in 1989? In 1989, the Computer Society of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, issued a press release that I achieved a technological breakthrough. And did so by discovering the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. That IEEE press release had an impact because the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers was the world's largest technical society. 
in the May 1990 issue of the academic journal named Software, the Computer Society of IEEE described the economic benefits of my scientific discovery of fastest computing and described it as, quote, the amount of money at stake is staggering. For example, you can typically expect to recover 10% of the field's oil. The Computer Society of IEEE continued, if you can improve your production schedule to get just 1% more oil, you will increase your yield by $400 million. End of quote. That 1989 press release issued by the Computer Society that announced my technological breakthrough and scientific discovery of the world's fastest computing and the companion articles published by the Computer Society in IEEE publications led to cover stories in, my, in many trade publications and led to front page stories that were titled African Supercomputer Genius wins top U.S. prize. And that 1989 press release issued by the Computer Society led to stories on my contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science. I discovered that the fastest computer can be built with the slowest processors. I discovered how and why using a thousand processors makes modern computers faster and makes the newest supercomputer the fastest. On July 4, 1989, the U.S. Independence Day in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, I discovered the Philip M. R. Guale formula for the world's fastest computing that later U.S. President, that later U.S. President Bill Clinton will describe in his White House speech of August 26, 2000. My technological breakthrough opened the door to the world's fastest computer that must be used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and solve such problems at the fastest speeds ever recorded. I visualized my scientific discovery of the world's fastest calculations, calculations as occurring across a new internet. Likewise, I visualize my new internet as defined as a new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors and standard parts. Furthermore, I invented how to use my new internet to send and receive emails and do both at the fastest bandwidths ever recorded. I invented how to parallel program my new internet. I visualized that new internet as a new global network of 65,536 or 64 binary thousand tiny identical computers. I theorized how to harness those processors and use them to communicate across another new global network of 1,048,000 576 or 1 binary million regular and short email wires that were equal distances apart. Not only that, I mathematically and experimentally invented how to solve 64 binary thousand initial boundary value problems that arise beyond the frontier of calculus and computational physics. I invented how to solve them at once and how to email and solve them across a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that define my new internet, and how to reduce 65,536 days or 180 years of time to solution within one processor, and reduce that computation time to one day of time to solution across my new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors that are identical, that shared nothing, and that's a supercomputer de facto. 
I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. A question asked in school essays is this. Why is Philip Emma Aguale famous? Before my discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, it was believed to be impossible to achieve the world's fastest computing and do so across the world's slowest processors. It made the news headlines when I discovered that the unimaginable to compute is possible to supercompute. However, understanding how I made the unimaginable possible wasn't what made the news headlines in 1989. What made the news headlines was that I did the then impossible. Namely, I discovered how to turn a vague idea, a mere theory, and a science fiction that was published on February 1, 1922, into reality. That science fiction was about 64,000 human computers forecasting the weather around the globe. On the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered how 64 binary thousand processors can be used to execute a global climate model. Such high-stake climate models are used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. I discovered how to turn that science fiction of 1922 to the non-fiction of 1989 that's now known as the world's fastest computing. In the traditional way of manufacturing supercomputers, one powerful processor is connected to one memory. That super fast processor executes one instruction at a time. In my alternative way of inventing supercomputers, I made the news headlines when I discovered that parallel processing is up to a billion times faster. I discovered the world's fastest computing on the 4th of July, 1989. I discovered supercomputing as it's executed today, or how they compute at the fastest speeds and do so across my ensemble of, 60, of the 64 binary thousand slowest processors in the world, I discovered the world's fastest computing on July 4, 1989. I discovered parallel processing. By dividing a compute-intensive discrete and algebraic approximation of an initial boundary value problem of calculus and physics, ranging from a global climate model to modeling the social distancing that reduces the spread of the coronavirus disease, within Nigerian buses that pack passengers like sardines. I chopped up each compute intensive problem into lesser challenging problems. Finally, I assigned one processor to solve one less compute intensive mathematical physics problem. Furthermore, I discovered the one problem to one processor correspondence, which I used to solve the 64 binary thousand mathematical problems that in totality are important societal problems. The list of 20 most compute intensive or grand challenge problems includes detailed climate modeling that must be executed with the fastest speed and accuracy. I discovered how to harness my 64 binary thousand processors which I used to de facto synchronously solve my two raised to power 16, 16 initial boundary value problems that I solved at once. My invention of how to execute the fastest computing can be extended to a billion processors which encircle an internet or a globe and did so as one seamless, coherent and gigantic supercomputer. In 1989, it made the news headlines that a Nigerian supercomputer genius in the USA had recorded the fastest speed in the history 
of computing and recorded that speed across the slowest processors in the world and recorded that speed while solving the most compute intensive problems in the world. I'm that Nigerian supercomputer scientist that was in the news. On the 4th of July, 1989, I recorded the highest speed up and the fastest speed in supercomputing. That scientific discovery led to my conclusion that fastest computing across a billion processors will become the technology that can yield a factor of one billion fold reduction in the world clock times for solving the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. That includes global climate models used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable long-term global warming. The most powerful supercomputers are used to address some of the world's biggest challenges. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. Thank you very much. Insightful and brilliant lecture.